Um, so, so we have the chance to have uh, Tanguy here tonight, uh, and so as, as Vladimir was saying, he um, in eight, ten years, he uh, worked in five growing startups, built three from the ground up. Um, two. Two. <laughs> um, and so, so we want to make this uh, as um, educational and, and as, um, um, as good for you as possible. Uh, and so maybe we can start by just um, seeing who's here. So if you guys could just raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur or, or aspiring to be an entrepreneur. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're an employee of a, of a startup or of a normal, normal company. <laughs> All right. uh, okay, so mostly entrepreneurs. Um, so, so let's start with maybe the, the, the context, um, what you did and, and the different companies that you worked at and what you did over the last 10 years. So your background is in computer science. Yes. Um, and then can you maybe tell us a bit more about the, the, the first company that you built? Yeah, sure. So um, um, I'm a software engineer. Um, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to launch my own company, but I didn't have an idea at that time. Um, I was 22. Um, and basically the first company I've done, it was while, while I was still a student. Um, it was uh, called Django, a carpooling company. Uh, but to be honest, we didn't know anything about how to build a company, how to build a team, uh, how to find uh, a market fit as we were still students and we didn't have any uh, previous um, experiences. Um, so that company was mainly focused on selling SaaS for carpooling uh, platform to, uh, to big companies in Belgium, but also in France and, and other countries. Um, and after 12 months, we realized that um, the big opportunity for us in mobility wasn't in B2B, but more uh, in B2C. And at that time, uh, it was in 2011, 2011, I think, yeah, um, Uber didn't exist. It was called uh, Uber Cab and, and only in uh, San Francisco. Um, and Lyft, the biggest competitor of Uber, didn't exist as well. Um, so we've been lucky because with my co-founder, we went to San Francisco uh, to pitch this new idea of connecting just a passenger and a driver using a mobile application. Soon it's like day-to-day -day business today, but uh, nine years ago, it wasn't the case. Um, and when we started pitching this idea in, in San Francisco, uh, we had quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of uh, feedbacks from, from VC and, and entrepreneurs and coach saying that, okay, you need to talk to those guys. And those guys, it was the CEO of Lyft. So we, we went to a meetup to meet him um, and he was pitching Lyft. Uh, so it was really the beginning and we, we tried uh, the service, we took a lift, he, they, they had at that time 20 drivers in, in San Francisco, uh, now it's a multi-billion uh, dollars company. Um, and for us it was really the haha -ha moment, I mean we really realized that we could do that um, in Europe because in, in San Francisco, I mean for us it was quite tough because we didn't have any network, um, uh, any connections there, so we decided to come back uh, from San Francisco uh, to Belgium and then and then France uh, to build that new product called Jump. Um, and when we launched in Paris, we basically launched at the same time than each uh, that still exists today. Um, and it was focused for, uh, it was built for the young people basically. Uh, the idea is when you go out, you need a ride, just open the app, call a driver, and then yeah, it, it's like Uber, but it was Uber prop. Um, and at that time, I was mainly focused on building the tech, um, but what really matters for that kind of company um, is the operations, um, because to be honest, the product doesn't really matter if you don't have good operations, and, and that we didn't know it at that time. So I would say that's, that's one of the biggest mistakes we, we did at the beginning of Jump, focusing too much on the product and not focusing enough on, on the operations, because it just... I mean, you need to call drivers, you need to have um, uh, people driving their car um, all night long for you, and it doesn't matter if the product is, is good or not, it, it just matters that you have people on the road. Um, and we realized that, but a bit too late, um, even though the, the growth for that company was quite, uh, quite good. I mean, we, for, for four years, we built that company. We had 15 employees, uh, thousands of drivers, uh, 200,000 uh, customers uh, in Brussels, Paris, and Lyon. 
Um, but then we had to, to uh, close this company because of a big strike uh, of the, the cab companies in Paris. I don't know if you remember, but uh, it was in 2015. They were, they were burning cars in the street. It was like civil war. So it was mostly for Uber Pop, right? Uh, yes, it, it was the, exactly the same the strikes, thing. And then, yeah. But then you ended up suffering. I know we, so so the, the strike was against Uber Pop, Each and Jump. Huh. Uh, and we also had a, um, a lawsuit against us uh, from the biggest uh, lobby of, of cab companies in Paris. Uh, and basically at that time we were, we were raising 2 million euros uh, for Jump. Um, we were supposed to receive the money 1st of July, um, but the strike was like the 25th of June. Uh, so <laughs> six days too, uh, too early for us. We, I mean the investors, they just uh, told us, okay, we need to wait until September to see Uh, what's going to be the situation. Um, but yeah, Uber, they announced at that time that they will stop uh, Uber Pop in, in Paris. Each decided to continue, but we didn't, uh, we, on, on our side, we didn't add any money to, to continue. Uh, and from one day to the other, you just have zero revenue because uh, 99% of the revenue were, were coming from Paris and Lyon, uh, not Brussels. Um, so yeah, we had to, um, to shut down the company, sell the assets to uh, Chauffeur Privé, uh, one of the other competitors in, in Paris. Um, but it was a really good experience for me because um, we learned how to build a product and how to build ops, but uh, it was more about finding the, the market fit and how to go from zero to one, uh, I would say. Um, and the next company was more Uh, about how you go from 10 to 100. What's interesting is you, you managed to live uh, the entrepreneurial story from, from beginning to end. Uh, so starting, raising, hiring, uh, growing, and act it actually working, um, up to uh, failing and, and having to announce to everyone and, um, that, it, that it was ending. I imagine yeah. that's something that you, you, you can't at anticipate and it always... Uh, no. And it, I mean, it makes you grow because when you have to announce to 15 employees that, I mean, we really just closed the company. Um, at that time, I was like 24, 25. Um, you need to um, to take time for yourself after that kind of uh, of adventure because uh, it's super tough. I mean, you you have and it's only the employees, but also the drivers. You have thousands of drivers working, kind of working for you. Um, and from one day to the others, you just say, uh, "Okay, it's uh, it's over." Um, so yes, it was um, it was quite quite difficult at that time. But uh, overall, I think it's, it was an amazing experience. Very cool. Um, and so then, so you took you took a bit of time for yourself. Uh, yes. And, and then you moved on to another uh, the, uh, operations heavy company. Yeah. So take it easy. Um, and, and to be honest, I only took one week off because after that I was <laughs> completely broke. Like, I had some debts <laughs> that I had to pay, I imagine, to pay yeah. back. Uh, but um, the good thing is, so Take It Easy is another um, Belgian startup. So I, I'm from Brussels. Um, and at that time, it was the beginning of food tech. Again, Deliveroo, Foodora, uh, Uber Eats, we all know them today. Uh, but 2015, 16, it was again the beginning. Uh, they just raised 16 million euros with um, Rocket Internet, um, and the plan was to roll out um, Take It Easy to multiple countries. Um, and as I was kind of managing Jump and also the, the, the supply side, so, so the drivers at Jump, uh, the CEO and, and my co founder of my, my uh, current startup, uh, Adrian, asked me to, to manage the, the couriers, so uh, basically the delivery uh, of, of the food from the restaurant to the, to the customer. Um, and it was just crazy because we had to scale from five cities to 30 um, and we had no playbook, um, uh, we had no process. Uh, yeah. you, you had the Rocket Internet uh, ecosystem. Yeah, and, but the thing is Rocket Internet is pushing like really hard to uh, make sure that you launch 10 cities <laughs> in a month that you don't have time to learn and it was amazing for me because it was a wonderful opportunity to, to build those processes, to build those playbooks. Um, and I mean, I was just going from one city to, to, to the other at some point mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we had the same process in, in London uh, compared to Paris, or Madrid, or Barcelona. Um, and it was completely crazy because everyone was just doing 
their shit because they didn't know, I mean, they didn't add any guidelines and we, did, we just asked them to hire couriers. Um, but at some point you need to have some kind of process and, and unify uh, how you do that kind of things in, mm -hmm. in the different cities. Um, and I really learned how to scale a business from yeah, three cities to, to multiple cities. Um, and to be honest, if, um, if I was able to choose how to do that, I would have waited way longer to launch those new cities. Because I, I mean, you always take the time that you have to build a playbook, to build uh, processes and stuff like that. But when you, 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 you've been pushed by someone, someone else you, and you don't have a choice, I mean, you just realize that uh, you can do this in a week and not in a month. And so that's, that was really interesting for me because uh, basically you don't have any limits. You just have the limits in kind of your mind. You think that it will take you a month to launch a city, but you can do it in a week. And you have to do it in a week because the week after you, you'll be in, a, in, a, in another city. So for me, that was um, more about execution and, and operations, take it easy, and scaling mm -hmm. from, it was 30 employees to 200 uh, at the end. And again, sadly, they had, they had to close uh, <laughs> the adventures because they didn't manage to raise more money from uh, yeah. uh, Rocket and, and other investors. It was a bit uh, complicated. Uh, yeah, a bit complicated because Rocket Internet invested in, in other companies. But anyway, um, again, wonderful opportunity for me to, to learn. Okay. So, so you, you, you from, from a computer science background, then you, you switch to uh, being a CEO and, and running the company, you, you stop the company and then you really focus on, on, on operations. Uh, so you already have a wide variety of, um, of, uh, of skills that you've developed there. Um, then you, you briefly worked at uh, Menu Next Door also, yep. o operations side again. Yes. Um, and then it brings you to, uh, so Menu Next Door uh, had to close also. Um, but I wasn't there. You, you, oh, you, you left before the end. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, so that brings you to three years ago. Yeah. Um, when so again, it's a related business that that, that you started. Uh, I think you even I, I read somewhere that you got the idea from seeing uh, all the the drivers from um, Take It Easy on their bikes and the bad bikes they had and, and the quality of of their their work tools. Yeah. Um, and so you you're now building a hardware company. Yeah. Uh, so, so again, another kind of uh, um, of story, yeah, of story. and challenges. Um, so, so Kobo, it's um, basically we build a new kind of e-bike for uh, young people living in big cities like Brussels, Paris, Berlin, uh, London. Um, we really focus on the design and tech. Um, and the story behind Kobo is that when you bike in Brussels, um, you have all those old people using an e-bike and going faster <laughs> than you. And two or three years ago, all the early adopters of the e-bike, it was those guys because basically an e-bike, um, it's uh, an help for them, uh, help for them to, uh, to continue to ride and use a bike. Uh, but if you adapt that technology uh, to, to build a classic bike and, and a bike really built for the city and really built for younger audience, you can really build something amazing. And those bikes at that time, they were all ugly, super heavy, super expensive. Um, and it was with that kind of really old display, black and white, uh, that you have on a, on a bike. We just realized that we could build something really different in that, in that space. Um, so we started to Google uh, e-bike factory Europe, and then we... China also. <laughs> China, yeah. We bought some, we, we, we bought some, uh, some tickets to, uh, to go in Asia, Taiwan, uh, Europe. We visited factories. We went to trade show for three months uh, with my, my co-founders, so Adrian and Karim. They were both co-founders of Take It Easy. Um, and we really started to realize that all the bike brands, uh, they don't do tech. They just buy from Bosch, from Shimano, uh, whatever. They buy a battery, controller, motor, display, so all the um, electrical kits. Uh, but they still focus on building a frame, choosing the right tires, choosing the right, uh, the, the right handlebar, but they don't do tech. Um, and we realize that by doing tech and by doing the battery yourself, doing the connectivity module yourself, we could really build something different. Um, so so the, the product, uh, it's already um, award winning, so we, we, we had like two awards. 
one from the biggest trade show in the bike industry, uh, and another one uh, from the Red Dot uh, Design Award. It's like the biggest award you can get in industrial design. Um, and thanks to that design and the tech, we can now uh, provide different kind of services because we sell only online. We don't have uh, distributors like classic bike brands. Um, and by doing that, we have a direct connection to the, to the consumer. And we use the app, so you need the application to unlock your bike. Uh, you don't have a key, you don't have a, a lock, whatever. You really use the application to unlock the, the, the bike. So, uh, for instance, if someone tries to steal your bike, you'll get a notification on your phone saying, careful, uh, something uh, is happening. Uh, you can also track your bike, stuff like that. Uh, but on top of that, we are building services. So you can buy an insurance for your bike directly in the application. Uh, you can, if you have a flat tire, just uh, send a message to the support and they will help you fix it either remotely, either we have, we have a partner coming to your, to your place. And all that customer experience is coming from Take It Easy and Jump. Um, and we really use tech and software to, to, to build services and to make sure that we have um, a compelling user experience co compared to the other bike brands. Uh, and I think that it, it's why today is successful in, in Belgium. So we, we only launched, we, we've only launched Belgium a few months ago uh, because it's one of the biggest market for e-bike, uh, even bigger than France. Because in France, and especially in Paris, you have scooter, but you don't have a lot of bike. You have more scooter on the bike lane than bikes, actually. Mm. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, we launched that in, in Belgium and now we're scaling the product in, in other countries as well. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think that's very interesting. Um, because to me, um, Cowboy is really about applying the, the DNVB model to uh, bikes, much like Casper did to, to mattresses. But you have really your edge of coming from software uh, and focusing on uh, the, the, the customer relation that you're creating and, and with, with the software. Um, and w w when, I, when I say that, it makes me think of, um, of, of Tesla. Uh, and I, I don't know how, how much of the production you internalize um, of, of the bike. How much of what? Of? Of, of the production, the, the industrial production of the bike. So do you just buy parts and, and, and assemble them? Or do you actually create? So we, we have almost everything custom except the, the tires, the handlebar, and the, the, the brakes. But mm -hmm. the rest we do it ourselves and then we assemble everything. Not ourselves, but we, with a, a partner. Okay. Um, so the, the reason why I was saying that is <clears throat> um, when uh, one anecdote that I find funny about the, the, the first Tesla they built is um, when they brought people to, to build a Tesla, uh, they brought engineers that weren't specifically um, made to, to, to or used to building cars. And so when they were building the, the acceleration mechanism, um, they actually used fiber optics because that's what they were use, used to using in the, in the internet companies. Um, and that actually meant that uh, the, the delay between when you press the accelerator and the acceleration was the fastest ever done in a, in a, in a car because uh, no other car, car, car company had the idea of doing that. And I was wondering if maybe you had something similar in, in building Cowboy and how your software background helped you in building a, a bike from scratch, really. Yeah, so um, we also have plenty of engineers coming from Toyota uh, and Tesla as well. Um, but... Um, the thing is, the bike industry, as I was saying, they, they don't do tech. So when you build your own system, the edge that we have compared to the others um, is that we control the, um, uh, the, the full experience. We, we can do whatever we want to do. Um, and for instance, Trek or Specialized, they will buy a, a, a kit from Canon and, and they need to use the application from, uh, uh, from Bosch. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And they need to use the application from Bosch. So um, the big difference between us and them is that we can, if you want to add insurance, we can do it. But you can't do it if you use the, the system of Bosch. So uh, for us, it's really the, um, the big difference. And then, and, and then for, for the bike itself, um, in the car industry, for instance, you use a lot of plastic. I mean, today you don't use aluminum anymore. You don't use uh, that kind of materials because it doesn't make sense. Uh, but today in the bike industry, I mean, you have carbon frames, you have aluminum frame, but you, do, you never use plastic because uh, it's just the way they do things for the last 20 years. Uh, but with, engin with the engineers that we have coming from the car industry, we're starting, yeah. we're starting to add more and more plastic so uh, into the bike. Built and yeah. Sure. And you can do way more with plastic compared to, to aluminum, uh, obviously. Cool. 
Very cool. Um, okay, so, so that was kind of a, a summary of the last 10 years. Um, I wonder what, what motivated you to, to start building your own companies in, in, in the first place? And has that uh, stayed the same over the years? Or, or do, do you find that your motivation has, has changed? So what I really like about all the companies I've, I've been working for um, is that I, I was always a user of the product. Um, and I really think it makes a big difference because um, it will help you to build not, maybe not the perfect product for everyone, but at least a perfect product for you because you know what you want. Um, and the, the, the bike uh, that I have today, I'm using it like every day, uh, 10 times a week uh, to, to move in, in Brussels. And I, every day I, I, I'm, I just realized, okay, we could do that better uh, in the app. Uh, that flow could be a bit better um, in the motor, in the controller. We could maybe uh, change that setting to improve the right feeling. Um, and I think that when you use a product and you are obsessed by the product, um, then it's just super easy to, to build something amazing because you just don't stop thinking about it. And what's really cool at Cowboy, for instance, is that all the employees, um, they use a the bike to come to work. So mm -hmm. everyone in the company is using the product every day. And so when you need to sell the product or when you need to, 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 to work on it, you know the product better than, every, than, than everyone else. And it was the same case for, for Jim. I was one of the first drivers of Jim, one of the first passengers <laughs> as well. No, but that's true. And you need, I, I really think that you need to, um, to understand every, everything and, and all the stakeholders. If I, if I take Jim, you need to understand what's, what's like to be behind the wheel for 10 hours. Uh, because it will help you, again, to build a better product or better, better flow for, for the customer or the driver. Um, and you can't do that if you do a, a SaaS B2B, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least myself, I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, so I would say obsessed by the product, and, uh, and then you need to keep learning. I, I love to learn. I, I, I mean, I just watch videos online all the time about new topics, and then I try to talk to a lot of, um, of smart people. Mm -hmm. um, and thankfully, with the, the investors that we have today, um, it's quite easy to have intro to amazing guy in, 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 in New York, in, in San Francisco. Like uh, I was talking about um, the, the city of Fitbit. I mean, when you can talk to someone like that uh, about an issue that you have, uh, it's, it's always super interesting. Yeah, that, that's, um, I think, something that you, you already touched upon um, in another interview, and that was that one of the things that you learned is to surround yourself uh, with, with people that you can talk to, like a kind of mentors, people who can teach you about um, how to do the stuff that you're, you're, you're trying to do. Um, and so I, I was wondering, like, do you have someone that uh, has followed you throughout the years, and what, what, what kind of stuff do they teach you? So um, I had plenty of mentors. I think that you need to change them quite often, because if you don't change, change them, it means that you don't, you don't evolve, basically. You don't learn enough. Um, and for every one of them, um, I had a really specific topic in mind, like fundraising, like sales, like marketing, uh, like building uh, a culture inside the company, um, building a hardware company. Mm -hmm. so it's also something different. Um, and the crazy thing is, a lot of people, they, they just want to help you, and you just need to ask them, and. and and be humble and say, okay, I, I want to learn more on that topic. And most of the time, it's just, it's just a coffee or a Skype call, and I do that like two or three times a month max. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, I try to have a really specific topic to talk about and just not an open discussion. But uh, so so, so you, have, you have a topic that you want to learn about. Yeah. You go on the internet, you find kind of the people who are good at that, and then you, you send them a call email. So I was doing that before, uh -huh. uh, but now today, you can get yeah, yeah, we have quite a quite a big network. So my my, my co-founders, so we can ask either the investors, either all the startups that we mm. know, mm. Um, and you always have someone like super smart in the network. For instance, we we talked to um, uh, the guy in charge of all the retails for Warby Parker in the U.S. They have hundreds of stores, um, and once you talk to someone like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just learn so much and you will not do all the mistakes that they, they've been mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's super interesting. And I, I really think you need to, um, to take time for yourself to acknowledge your, your weakness. Yeah. 
uh, and then just work on it. And I mean, if you have the, the right people to help you, it should yeah. be quite fast. Yeah. No, that, that, that's interesting because um, it, it touches upon something that um, we, we believe in at the family and part of the reason why the family was started. Uh, and it's that ambition can be taught and that surrounding yourself by ambitious people will make you uh, more ambitious. Um, and I think that's something that can be seen in the different companies that you started. Um, and like starting a hardware company, I mean, it's, it's in the name, it's, it's hard. Um, and that way um, you can see that uh, maybe because you surrounded, you created this environment around you uh, of, of ambitious people. Um, did you feel that has affected your, your, your own ambition? Yeah, so the most ambitious uh, person I know is my, my co-founder, Adrian, and, and the CEO of the company. Uh, that guy has no limit, like really no limits. Um, and the fact that he's always pushing, um, I had to change and I had to be the same because uh, if I wasn't the same, I would always push back and we need to be aligned. Um, and I really can see the, the transformation. Uh, and I mean, I, for instance, at Jump, just pitching a VC in Paris for me was like, wow, that's the thing. Um, today, I mean, we, we didn't even go to Paris. US, uh, for, US with index, yeah, we, we went to London and to, and to New York. And so it's just, at, at some point, you, 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 have, you just have the limits that you set yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks to my, my co-founder, I, I really think we, we don't have limits anymore. We just do what we think is right. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. also, we try to meet like, amazing people. Uh, as I was saying, mm -hmm. um, and we don't say, okay, no, that guy will never want to talk to us because we are uh, just those two guys from Brussels. I mean, if you just go and, and ask questions and you, yeah, you get the right intro, uh, then mm -hmm. everything's possible. Cool. Um, another thing that's, that's interesting um, about your, your past uh, and, and your present is... Um, the, the transition from, from software to, to hardware. Uh, I mean, you, you, you have very different challenges. I think you, you experienced some pretty, uh, pretty harsh uh, problems with like production and shipments and, and stuff like that. Uh, can you maybe tell us a bit more about how that went, uh, going from, from software to hardware? Yeah. So the, the big difference between hardware and software is that um, in software, you have a bug, you push some code in production, and then the bug is fixed. And that's it. Um, in hardware, you have a bug in, the, in your product. You need either to do a recall, uh, either you need to do some kind of service campaign to fix it, but it's, it's a nightmare to manage. And then, and then you need to wait a couple months to get the new parts. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's, a, it's completely different. And in, in hardware, you always have to plan months, even years in advance. Uh, because for instance, we have components in the bike. We need to order them like five to six months in advance. Um, so it's really a game of first planning. And then uh, the um, complex thing about Cowboy and, and what we're building is how the hardware inside the bike um, is talking to the controller, the motor, but also to the mobile application. Uh, then the mobile application is talking to the back end. Then the bike is also talking to the back end. Uh, and then on top of that, you, you have the website and, and the consumer facing um, application. So um, we have like seven teams in engineering and those seven teams they need to align on one planning um, and you have complete uh, different life cycle like for for instance the, the hardware you don't work with a sprint um, i'll give you an example um, so today we were supposed to receive a shipment uh, for, from asia uh, and it was planned for months um, today we just had the news that we we lost the shipment we just don't know where it is. Uh, and you have that kind of thing happening in, in, in the planning, you, you need to manage it. Mm -hmm. And now we have to pass certifications with a bike we don't have. Um, and so certification, you have to book a lab two months in advance. So it means that you need to replan that somehow. So it's, it's really about planning and making sure that you um, uh, anticipate correctly. But what's amazing about hardware is that you can really build something um, tangible and in web, you have the design, the UX, but it's, it's quite, I mean, you, you can't do a lot of things for, for, for the customer. Um, when you build something physical, I mean, just the feel of 
when you touch the bike and, and the feel of some plastic part and the feel of the battery, like the click when you lock the battery, all those mm -hmm. small elements, you can work on it. And, and it's quite amazing because you can really f think about the full experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that you don't have in, in, in software. Uh, and I, I personally think it's amazing because you, yeah, you can build uh, something completely different from the competition thanks to that because you mix hardware, software, and services together uh, to, to deliver an amazing experience to the customer. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so you, you, you said there that you had so seven teams in your engineering team? Yes. Uh, so how many of you now at uh, Co Cowboy? Um, we have 35, 35 employees. 35, okay. Um, and so how you, you, were, you were telling me that one of the biggest things that you learned is, is about recruiting. Yeah. Um, can, can you maybe tell us what, what you did with this one and, and why it's better? Yeah, so um, hiring someone, it's, it's super difficult because um, first it will take you a lot of time to, to find the right, the right candidate. And then second, if you do a mistake, um, you will pay that mistake for months, maybe years. Uh, so you really need to take time to find the, the, the right candidate. And before Cowboy, to be honest, we didn't add any process, any clear process at least at, uh, at Jump or even Take It Easy. And Take It Easy, when they had to scale the companies from 30 employees to 200 employees, they just had to do it and, and they weren't ready. So we had to, when, we had to scale, uh, when we had to scale Cowboy from, uh, so we had four employees just uh, just um, a year ago. So we had to hire 30 people in uh, in 12 months. Um, so after the, the fundraising of 10 million euros, we took a step back and we really defined first the, the, the values of the company. So quite important things to know is that you can still define the values after two years of experience. I mean, you just need to do it. It doesn't matter if, you, if it wasn't defined at the beginning of the company and you can still change them afterward. Um, I mean, we, it's, it, for us, it's really a living thing. Um, and once you have those values, you need to define a process to make sure that everyone in the company that you will um, hire will be aligned on those values. Um, and so what we do is we have four uh, steps at Cowboy. Um, each of those steps um, will be focused on, on some values, but also some clear cr um, criteria. So what we did before is sometimes we just say, okay, we need someone to do ops. Mm -hmm. And then we, we've been looking for an ops manager. Uh, but what we really do at Cobo is defining the scope of the, of the job because it will help you to, um, to again find the right candidate because if you know what that guy will be, will be doing every day, you'll be able to ask more questions and, more, and precise questions about that. You can't do that if, you just, if you're just looking for an ops manager, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we always do, and it's super interesting for us, it's the, the work sample or the, the case presentation. So for every job at Cobalt, you need to prepare something for like three, four hours. Uh, it's always a technical case or marketing presentation, or depending on the job. That, that, that's part of the selection. That's of the, part of the, of the, of the selection, yeah. Um, and everyone is grading that case based on some criteria. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end, it's just an average of uh, all those criteria. So it's a scale from zero to four. Um, and you don't have those discussions like, yeah, I really like this guy, but I didn't like that guy. It's really focused on something um, tangible and H hard skills. Sorry, like hard hard skills. Hard skills, but also soft skills and, and values. Okay. And if you did the values job well, um, when you like that guy, it should be aligned on the values. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time, and again, we had uh, we had some help from uh, from, an from from our investors. I mean, the guy who scale um, the hiring process of Deliveroo went to Cowboy and really teach us how to hire, um, how to prepare an interview, uh, how to grade, how to make sure that you don't use your bias because that's really something we, we've been doing at Cowboy before. And today we really try to remove, remove all the bias that we have. Um, and I really think that's something we should learn. And as an entrepreneur, it's always easy to say, I don't have time for that because it doesn't have an immediate impact mm -hmm. on the company. But long term, it brings so much value that once you need to hire a few people, you really need to, mm -hmm. to, to take time to really define, okay, uh, we're looking for that kind of, uh, of, of employee. Um, and 
it's going to be the process to make sure that uh, everyone in the company is aligned on that. Yeah, it, it completely makes sense. Um, is, is that the, the biggest lesson that you've learned over the, the companies? Yes, I, I think the most difficult part for us today is building the, the, the right team. team. Mm -hmm. um, and it was quite a big transition for me because at some point I was doing the mobile application, the back end, uh, some marketing, some, I mean, almost everything. I was doing the fundraising with, with Adrian. Um, and then from one day to the other, I was, I needed to delegate everything because uh, I build a, a back end team, front end team, mobile team, firmware team, hardware team. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to make sure that you, you have the right people. And, and to be honest, I didn't know uh, shit about hardware. So I really took also quite a lot of time to make sure that all the people we've been hiring, um, they, we, we have smart people in house to, to challenge them. So we ask external advisor to do the interviews for us, uh, to assess some technical skills, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know what's the difference between a, a good hardware engineer and, and an excellent hardware engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's something we didn't do at, uh, at Jump or, or Take It Easy. And for me, it's so important that yeah, it's so the main main lesson. Still learning new things, even though. Uh, uh, yeah, every day, almost every day. <laughs> you try. I, I I think that's something um, certainly that we look for um, in in entrepreneurs. It's the the intellectual curiosity. Uh, that means you're constantly expanding your 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 comfort zone, um, but you you also keep moving on, and 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 you it just keeps growing until you can challenge people. Um, on their, their topic, their expertise, uh, while you're a generalist and you're, you're taking care of all these different things. Um, and I think that's why it's, it's been going so well for you at Al Cowboy. Yeah, yeah, I think when you know what's going to be the job of, of the, um, the employee you, you will be hiring, it's always easier to, to make sure that the guy will do a, a good candidate because you know exactly what you need. Yeah. Uh, if you hire someone for something that you didn't do it yourself, yeah. um, it's always difficult. So even hardware, I mean, I, was, I didn't know fit. anything and I, I was trying to learn um, about hardware. And I think that having some, some background at least help you uh, ask more relevant questions uh, mm -hmm. for, for the candidates. Okay. Um, so, so you were saying that you, you always ask, um, you, you took the habit of asking other people for, for advice. Do you have now people that come to you for, for advice? Uh, it, it, yes, <laughs> it's happening on some, some topics. Um, in, I would say that in Belgium we don't have a lot of startups in, in hardware, so we have quite a few people asking us questions about uh, production, uh, how do you build the first prototype, mm -hmm. uh, because what's really difficult in hardware is that you First, you need money. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can, you, can do, you can do it without money, but it's, it's difficult. And compared to software, it's, uh, it's another story because software, you can do everything without money, but hardware, at some point, you need to build something and you need really uh, specific skills to do that. So you, you can't do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've learned a lot uh, doing that. Um, and so, yeah, we have people asking us questions about I have an ID uh, for this hardware startup. Mm. How do I do? Uh, mm. yeah. And is there a, a common mistake or, or misconception that you see in those people? Is there is there something that you think people don't anticipate just because they they stay at the idea level and they they never confront it really with the market? They spend too much time on on just thinking about thinking. the product um, and not executing something. Um, and that, that, that's the rocket internet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, hardware, it's, it's difficult because you could say you need to plan, you need to, um, to make sure that uh, everything will be perfect. Um, but I still think you can, you can learn a lot. Um, like for instance, at Cowboy, uh, from day one, we had a Facebook group, like 500 uh, friends. Mm -hmm. um, and we started to post uh, every two weeks, I would say, some concepts, some ideas about Okay, it's going to be the design for the battery. That's going to be the design for the lights, uh, for the frame. And we had quite a lot of feedbacks. We did a focus group. Uh, and that's, I mean, at some point you need to take a decision and you don't always take the feedbacks that you, that you receive from your friends or, mm -hmm. or advisors. But at least it will help you iterate and you can iterate on concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still something tangible, even if it's, something, even if it's only a 3D. Yeah. Um, 
you can still do quite a lot of things quite fast mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to build everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that for someone launching an hardware venture, uh, the big mistake would be to build something from day one. In, in a room without uh, yeah, in the talking room without to everyone yeah. for two or three years. And you, uh, yeah. And it has the added benefit of creating already a link with, with people who are interested in your product even before it comes out. Yes, and you learn so much just by talking to people uh, that even for hardware, it's, it's really relevant. Because you, so you raised pre, your, your first uh, round, you raised before even having a product, you had a prototype? Yeah. Uh, no, on slide. Yeah, uh, on no. just, just a deck without yeah. any hardware. Yeah. Okay. We didn't know to do hardware, so we had to, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to do something. Okay, and, and, and then you basically pre-sold your first batch of, of, uh, of bikes even before it, it was out. Uh, we didn't pre-sold it, but we, we've been out of stock for months now uh, yeah, because of the demand in, in Belgium, yeah. Um, okay, um, so thank you very much uh, for, for, for coming. Thank you. Kill off on the lead. Kill off on the lead.